acquiring skills can be explained in three stages. First, the student is in the cognitive stage. This means that learning is based in factual knowledge. The student can memorize steps in a procedure and may be unaware of their progress or will fixate on one performance-related item. In the associative stage, the student is in the practice mode of doing things and is associating key elements of the task into their performance. They no longer need to do things from a memorized script or procedure, but instead can make assessments of their own progress and make changes and adjustments. In the automatic response stage, the student can perform the skill automatically and will have time to do other things simultaneously. During this stage, the performance of the skill is rapid and smooth. The student will also make fewer adjustments. Students will often say that they have the feel of the maneuver or skill at this point. In order for students to be able to progress, they have to have knowledge of the results of how they performed a task or skill. The instructor should tell the student as quickly as possible after the skill or task is complete how they did and what they can do to improve their performance. Skills in aviation are developed by practice. As a general rule, the more practice sessions there are, the better the performance of the skill will be. However, there is also a natural impediment to learning, and it's called a learning plateau. This simply means there will be a point where progress is slower than normal. This is often due to the students reaching capability limits, or the student may be consolidating levels of a skill. In any event, a good technique to use is after repeating a task three or more times, it's important to give that task a break and do something different. You can also shift their place in the training syllabus for a while to show progress in other areas. In order for students to acquire a skill and learn how to implement this in an automatic way, they need to practice. In the beginning, deliberate practice is used. This means the student is practicing something with a specific goal in mind. During this practice, the student will practice specific areas for improvement and will receive instructor feedback after the practice session. Block practice is practicing the same thing until it becomes automatic. Short-term memory is enhanced by repetition. This can lead the student or instructor to think that the item or the task has been mastered, which it probably is not the case. Block practice simply enhances the current skill at the moment and does not improve concept learning or retrieval from long-term memory. Random practice mixes up skills to be acquired during a practice session. This is the most valuable type of practice because retention is better by the student and they can use concept learning. When is learning achieved? Overlearning is the continued study of a skill after initial proficiency has been achieved. The problem with overlearning is the student can start developing automatic routines for things like weight and balance and checklist usage. For example, a student may begin focusing on weight and balance tools and use them so much that concepts of weight and balance and the thoughts that should trigger a response do not. In determining the application of skill, the instructor should be asking, can the student use what has been learned? In order to do this, the student must learn the material to where it becomes natural and automatic and also to realize where it's appropriate to use this skill. To help students acquire skills, the instructor should do the following. Tell the student that it takes practice. Monitor the student practice and give immediate feedback. Avoid distracting the student while they're practicing and let them know that learning plateaus are common and can be overcome with more practice. Putting it all together. Multitasking is critical to flying an airplane. It is a skill that must be acquired. In order to do this, a pilot may use a technique called attention switching. This is where a student, for example, will use a checklist in the run-up area, then switch attention to performing a task, then go back to the checklist. Ultimately, simultaneous performance is required. This means that the student is doing more than one thing at a time, such as turning while speaking to ATC on the radio. Learning to multitask is something all pilots must do. Students struggle when there are distractions and interruptions, so in the beginning the instructor should keep these to a minimum. Of course, we want to introduce distractions and interruptions to make a competent, complete pilot, but we need to save that until they can first multitask. Students will also have difficulty due to fixation or attention problems. Some students become obsessed with achieving numbers like headings and altitudes and focus all of their attention to a single instrument or control as the number nears. Checking to see where the student is looking and for how long will help you determine what the student is fixating on. 
pointing out the student is fixating is a way to help overcome it. Obstacles to learning. When people believe there is unfair treatment going on, it presents an obstacle to learning for that student. Impatience happens quite frequently with the private pilot student. They tend to want to get out to the airplane as quickly as possible and minimize the ground time. This is in part due to the misconception that learning to fly is all about the stick and rudder skills. More often than not, the aviators that find themselves in trouble are typically the ones who have weak ground knowledge foundation. This is especially true for IFR pilots. The other reason people have a misconception in aviation is that when they got their driver's license, the knowledge required was very minimalistic, while the control manipulations was most of what was expected and required to get the driver's license. When people are emotionally upset, they will not learn very well and will derive very little benefit from instruction. What goes on in the student's world will transpire into their capability to learn in the classroom or airplane. People who have a physical discomfort of some kind will tend not to concentrate on the task at hand. This could include having had recent surgery, bladder problems, or any physical discomfort to the student that would keep his mind away from complete submersion in the task or topic at hand. Apathy, due to inadequate instruction, or what they view as that, can cause them to give up on you as an instructor. This often occurs with instructors who exhibit poor organization, even new students will recognize when a lesson has not been well prepared for. When students are anxious, they will also tend to burden the instructor, which will limit the student's perceptive ability and the development of insights. Errors. Students will, of course, make errors during training. There are two types of errors, slips and mistakes. A slip occurs when a person plans to do one thing, but then inadvertently does something else. These are errors of action. Forgetting to do something is a slip. Time pressures are a common source of slips. The more hurried a person's work becomes, the more a slip is likely. Mistakes occur when a person plans to do the wrong thing and is successful. Mistakes are errors of thought. Our goal should be to reduce error. It is, of course, impossible to eliminate error, but we must try to minimize the number and scope of errors. Tools to do that are taking time, checking for errors, using reminders, developing routines, and raising awareness. The instructor must teach the student how to recover from errors. The instructor does this by giving the student practice from recovering from commonly made errors. Also, the student should be learning from the errors they make. Instructors should explain that errors occur at all skill levels. Errors tend to decrease with practice and experience. Explain the difference between slips and mistakes. Explain how students can minimize errors. Allow the student practice from recovering from errors. Point out errors when they occur and ask the student to say why they occurred. Motivation. Motivation is the reason a person acts or behaves in a particular way. It is the underlying reason a person will set a goal and achieve something. Motivation comes from many places. Some students have a fundamental interest in aviation, others are driven by it that it's technical in nature, and still others like the sense of community it offers. It's important that a student is self-motivated. This can be determined by a simple questionnaire which could ask questions like, have you ever flown a small airplane? Why do you want to learn how to fly? How do you envision using this after the training is done? All of these questions require the student to demonstrate some motivation towards learning to fly. Maintaining motivation. Keeping a student motivated is part of any instructor's job. This can be obtained by rewarding successes along the way and presenting up new challenges when they are bored with something or have learned something to an acceptable standard. Students will often show drops in motivation due to any number of reasons. It's important to discover the reason and explain why they are not any different to other students and that learning to fly is a challenging skill that they can in fact complete. Instructors should ask new students about their training goals, reward small successes along the way, present new challenges, remind students about the goals they set out for themselves, and assure students that learning plateaus are normal and to keep practicing. Memory. Memory is an important link between student learning and retention of information and to applying what was learned. 
When a student recalls a past experience or skill, the information about the experience has been encoded, stored, and retrieved. There is no universal agreement on how memory works, but there is a model we can use to show the relationships between the different types of memory. This model has three parts, sensory memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory. Sensory memory is that part of memory that gets the initial stimuli from the outside world and processes this according to the person's belief of what's important. The sensory register processes information quickly and can throw out those items that the person does not think important. For example, a fire engine alarm when driving will cause the person to focus on the noise and location of the alarm while discarding other noises or images that are perceived not to be relevant at the moment. The sensory register must pass important information into short-term memory quickly. Any information in short-term memory for more than about 30 seconds begins to fade rapidly. A person decides whether or not to move this information to long-term memory. This transfer is done by a process called coding. Transfer of memory. The process of coding data will happen consciously and subconsciously and will move from working to long-term memory. You can rehearse information several times until you have learned it. Your brain will code the information and the more you repeat it, the easier it will be for you to recall the information. It will then be related to information we already have stored in our memory. This will enable the transfer from working to long-term memory. When short-term memory gets a hold of information, it starts coding it to see how it is related to other information that is stored so it can be recalled later or used at the moment. It takes 5 to 10 seconds for data to be processed and moved into long-term memory. If the process is interrupted or prevented, the item can be lost in about 30 seconds. Students can think of approximately 5 to 9 items at any given time. This is far less than the information detected by the senses. The working memory punchline. Remember, the aircraft is a lousy classroom. It's noisy, distracting, and busy for the student to be able to process all the new information and retain the information for future use. A good technique is to not to explain to a student what he did wrong on his landing until the aircraft is off the runway and a complete stop and you have complete control of the aircraft. This allows your student to be able to process the information you are conveying. Allow the student to properly process the material you prevented. This is especially important in the early stages of training. Long-term memory. Long-term memory is a reconstruction of an experience and is not an exact recall. Memories are susceptible to alteration over time due to personal biases and perceptions as well as individual motivations. In some cases, memories can be created and believed as if they were real, even if they are not. A good example is an event that two people previously attended, and one person's perception of the event is different from the other. They may recall certain events that did not occur. It is interesting to note that both parties will disagree on the events that took place until confronted with that information from a video or photographs of the event. Retention. Praise stimulates responses which give a pleasurable return and tends to cause the action to be repeated. The information will be recalled as long as the information is of special interest or application to the student and is promoted by association. People learn and remember only what they wish to know. Favorable attitudes will aid retention. Although we generally receive what we learn through our eyes and ears, other senses also contribute to most perceptions. When several senses respond together, a fuller understanding and a greater chance of recall is achieved. Each meaningful repetition allows a student an opportunity to gain a clear and more accurate perception of the subject to be learned, but mere repetition alone does not guarantee retention. Forgetting and retention. Each of the theories imply that when a person forgets something, it is not actually lost. Rather, it is simply unavailable for recall. The instructor's job is to make certain that the student's learning is readily available for recall. Forgetting. The theory of disuse suggests that a person forgets things which are not used. Apparently, the memory is there, locked in the recesses of the mind. The difficulty is summoning it up to consciousness. 
Not using information for an extended period of time may cause you to forget. Next, there is interference theory, which means that people forget something because a certain experience has overshadowed it, or that the learning of similar things has occurred. Similar material that is not well learned will interfere with memory more than dissimilar material. This is especially true when learning similar things simultaneously. Freudian psychology advances the view that some forgetting is due to repression, which is the submersion of ideas into the conscious mind. What this means is that a bad experience may be forgotten due to the anxiety produced by that experience. To sum it up, repression is the ability to bury unpleasant experiences in the subconscious, which then prevents it from being recalled. Transfer of learning. An example of positive transfer of learning is using a checklist for a new type of airplane to do a pre-flight. If, for example, you trained in a 172 and go into a 152 or similar style of airplane, you will most likely be able to do most of the pre-flight. Negative transfer of learning could occur when trying to transfer your ability to drive a car into taxiing an aircraft. Because the steering wheel in a car looks similar to the control wheel in an airplane, people tend to try to steer the airplane with the control wheel instead of their feet. Early on in aviation training, a student needs to develop good habits with regards to study and application of skill. Because knowledge and skill are at a high level in aviation, students need to use a building block approach to learning in order to develop good habits. Once a pilot begins understanding what he is learning, the effect of the pilot's memory is improved. Recall is easier and the memory is more complete. We of course have issues with students in remembering things during their training. This is mostly due to the lack of frequent use of the skill or knowledge. When students leave the training environment, there is no guarantee that they will remember what was taught. Continued practice of what they have learned is the only means of retaining what they have learned. As the student's flight instructor, you will be the focal point of the student's source of knowledge. The student should also seek out other people like mechanics, line crew, other students, and other pilots to expand their sources of knowledge and to gain insight and perspective. To aid students with the transfer of learning, the instructor should discuss the differences between short and long-term memory, explain how frequent and recent usage affects memory, explain that a depth of understanding about a topic aids recall of that information, Encourage students to use mnemonic devices when studying. Explain the benefits of studying at regular spaced intervals and the disadvantage of cramming. Constructivism. As a flight instructor, you are the creator of experiences rather than the transmitter of information. You will guide your students through the use of well-planned exercises and problems for them to build their own building blocks of learning. They will construct knowledge based upon these experiences. Effective communication. Now that we've laid some groundwork for the understanding of human behavior, it's time to see how to convey thoughts and ideas. This section will give you insight into how the communications process works, and you'll also learn about some tools to make you a better communicator. The basic elements of the communication process include the source, the symbols, and the receiver. Symbols are the tools used to show the particular topic, such as words, language, and any other media. Words that are used without actual images may portray different meanings in different receivers. A receiver is typically the subject that is being taught. In our case, the subject is the student who is learning to fly. Lack of common experience will lead to student barriers. Confusion between the symbol and the symbolized object could lead students not to comprehend the subject matter. Also, overuse of abstractions will stray your students from the intended description. Interference is the prevention of a process or activity from being carried out properly. Barriers to effective communication. There are many barriers to effective communication. Some of these are lack of common core experience. For example, using the word aileron to a new student may cause confusion as the student is not familiar with an aviation-specific word yet. When you say words, people get mental pictures of images in their minds. By not choosing the right word, you could place the wrong mental image or symbol in the student's mind and lose the meaning of what you're trying to communicate. The overuse of abstractions such as, that airplane is fast, or that airplane is slow, can also be confusing. How fast an airplane is perceived is based on the person's own experience. It may be fast to you, but slow to someone else. 
Interference also plays a role in not communicating clearly. This can be caused by anything that gets in the way of a process or activity from being carried out properly. This could be physiological, environmental, or psychological. For example, if someone has an illness, if it's a loud environment, or the student and instructor are not committed to the lesson, these would cause interference. You can develop your communication skills by a variety of methods. Role-playing, where you are the instructor and someone you know as a student, helps. Instructional communication is when an instructor is teaching a particular topic and uses examples of past experiences, engages the student with questions, and tests comprehension. Listening is a vital part of being an instructor. Listening is not only hearing, but is hearing with comprehension. Questioning during communications allows you to see if the student comprehends the subject matter and at what level. The use of open-ended questions can help stimulate conversation and allow you to get insight into how the student is thinking and what they have comprehended about a topic. Lastly, when you know a subject at just above the level of the student, it can be difficult to answer student questions. When an instructor continues to learn and achieves a higher level of knowledge about a topic, the instructor is better equipped to handle questions or give different examples. This is known as instructional enhancement. Effective listening techniques. It's important to be a good listener. What does that entail? Here are a few pointers. Look for underlying feelings. Sometimes what is being said is not what is trying to be explained. Personal feelings can influence subject matter. Concentrate on what is being said. Avoid rehearsing answers while you're listening. To be an effective instructor, form answers thoughtfully and thoroughly. At times, instructors will tend to jump the gun and have an answer before a student has the opportunity to ask the full question. Do not insist on the last word. Remember, it's not a competition. Don't interrupt. Don't judge. Think before answering. Be close enough to hear. And watch nonverbal behavior and be aware of biases. Listening is a skill we use most at approximately 45% of the time, yet it is taught the least. Writing is used the least at only 9% of the time, yet we teach it the most. Reading is next least used and most taught. Talking is next most used, next least taught. What all this means is that listening is a skill that we have to develop ourselves. It is just as important for students to learn to listen effectively. The percentage of information transfer can be increased by teaching the student how to listen effectively. Listening could also be affected by the student's fear of the subject matter. If a student has fear about spins, the subject matter may not be instilled in the student. The student would have to make a conscious effort to place the fear aside to increase their potential to be more successful.